As a physician who works at the hospital um, and in the outpatient clinic, I fortunately I have the privilege of helping people. Unfortunately, in the last 10 years of life, I see a lot of suffering where the quality of life is extremely poor. So I always think, well, I used to just go to the hospital, make my rounds, make my recommendations, write my orders, and that felt good because I thought I was helping people, but then it was like, maybe I'm just extending a poor quality of life. And at some point, it dawned on me that sometimes when you wait till people are that debilitated, that it may be too late, so why don't I start intervening and educating people before they're at that stage. And that's why I became a public speaker and an author of a book, which um, I have outside if you are interested in reading it. Um, I like to call it The Vegan Maker. <laughs> if you read it, I'm sure you're going to go fan base. Or like Pastor Jensen said, maybe take small steps towards becoming plant-based because sometimes you don't have to be perfect to get the benefits of a plant-based diet. Uh, myself and the two dietitians who are very talented, James and Dahlia Marin, who work uh, with me in the same clinic, you know, yes, we eat a perfect plant-based diet, but you know, we're also, um, we have to practice what we preach. But uh, for you guys, if, if you're not 100% plant-based, don't worry about it. Just take little steps towards it and you'll get tremendous amounts of benefits. And in the future, if you want to take a leap and even be even more plant-based than more power to you. No pressure. But I'm a gastroenterologist and um, I care about the gut. So today I want to talk about the omnivore diet versus the plant-based diet and just kind of give you guys a little comparison in regards to the gut health. I'm sure you've heard a lot of cardiologists talk about this, but the GI tract is special to me. So I'm going to talk about the GI tract. Um, I'm sure you've had, how many people here have met people with IBS? Look at that, so many people. Well, I have a clinic full of people with irritable bowel syndrome, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which I will tell you what that is if you don't know what it is, but uh, it's very common and it all has to do with the gut microbiome and what we eat. So let's get started. Hopefully I teach you guys um, a little bit about the GI tract and about nutrition in regards to keeping your GI tract healthy. I love this quote, so I'm going to share it with you. With one, within one linear centimeter of your lower colon, there lives and works more bacteria, about a hundred billion, than all humans who have ever been born. Yet many people continue to assert that it is we who are in charge of the world. <laughs> all right. So are we helpless then? We're not in charge anyway, right? So that's why I'm here today. Because what if you could provide a powerful environment for this gut microbiome to help you based on what nutrition you're putting in your body rather than work against you? So through your nutrition, your nutritional choices, you could control how this microbiome is going to react. It turns out that the microbiome is the first organ that the food that you're putting in your body interacts with. Yes, and I called it an organ. It's not the heart, it's not the GI tract, it's not the liver, but it's, it is an organ, and quite possibly the largest organ in your body. Even larger than skin, brain, heart, 100 trillion microbiome live in your gut. The food that goes in your body interacts with this gut microbiome. The food becomes what we call a substrate. And you can control what kind of, and so based on this interaction of the substrate, which is food with this gut microbiome, you could either promote health or disease. Why? Because through that interaction, there are thousands and thousands of biochemical reactions that occur. And what happens as the result, there's production of what we call metabolites. These metabolites could either be health promoting and circulate through your body from head to toe and create health, 
or they can do the exact opposite, circulate through your body and produce disease. I'm going to test you. Who's been reading all these plant-based books from all these different doctors? All right, a few of you guys. Let's see if you know. Have, have you guys ever heard of short-chain fatty, fatty acids? Awesome. I love this group. I'm coming back. <laughs> That's a metabolite based on eating something healthy. If you eat a piece of broccoli, that metabolite comes from fermentation. And, and based on the bacteria fermentation, and that's a healthy metabolite that circulates through your body and causes health. Have you guys heard of TMAO? Awesome. That's an example of the ex exact opposite of the spectrum of an unhealthy inflammatory um, metabolite or molecule, right? So if you eat vegetables, you got short-chain fatty acids, healthy. If you ate meat, you got TMAO, that's unhealthy. And all of that came because of all the biochemical interactions that came about because of your gut microbiome. Everyone understands that? Awesome. So when we think of gut microbiome, a lot of times people think of bacteria, but there is actually viruses that live there, fungi that lives there, archaea that lives there, and protozoa that lives there. In fact, you know, there's an obsession with these Canada cleanses. And, you know, James is an, is an environmental um, uh, nutritionist. And one day we were thinking about this. I was like, James, you know, it's really weird how people are so obsessed about Canada cleanses. Why are people doing that? He's like, you know, I don't know. Because when you study the soil, it turns out that, you know, the fungi and the bacteria kind of balance each other out. And if you kill one population, the other one overgrows. So I'm like, whoa. That is so weird. Like, yes, our body is kind of like the soil too. If you disturb the balance of one, something else could take over, right? So don't try to mess with nature, okay? It's doing great on its own sometimes, and you don't have to mess with it. Um, oh, and people go on these extreme candida cleanses, but then they eat meat and dairy and eggs, which is like causing harm. So it's like, wait, before you go on these harsh cleanses, let's clean up the diet and see how you feel. Okay, so from mouth to anus, there are a hundred trillion gut microbiome. Okay, hundred trillion. I can't even imagine how big that number is, but yes, anyway. The majority of this biome lives in the large bowel, in the colon. So there's some living here in the esophagus stomach and the small bowel. There is a little bit few more in this um, small bowel here in the jejunum and the ileum and about 99% of the bacteria live in the colon. And see what the diversity is. There's just hundreds of different types of uh, bacteria that live there. This is important because I'm going to get into IBS and SIBO, and you're, you'll understand um, why. Because let me, let me just, I don't want to get too complicated, but if there is, so there's 100 trillion bacteria, but 99% is supposed to live in the colon. But if there's an over inoculation or overgrowth of this bacteria, which is supposed to be colonic type, in this area, you're going to get significant bloating and gas when you eat, okay? So what happens is the fermentation is supposed to happen in the large bowel, but if that fermentation happens in the small bowel here, suddenly people feel very distended and bloated, all right? So that's called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And why is that important? Because in the past, we used to separate SIBO and IBS, but now we know it's actually SIBO is IBS. So when you treat people who have SIBO and IBS, if you treat their SIBO, their IBS goes away. So this is a very important discovery that has come about in the recent years. So this is sort of cool. I think you guys have, um, you know, have you ever wondered, like, how do you have flatulence? Like, where does that come from? So here it is. My son would love this topic. Actually, Layla, your daughter, would like it even more. All right, so carbohydrates um, escape small intestinal digestion. So most of the food, well, actually not most of it, some of the food that we eat encounter pancreatic enzymes in the small bowel and the duodenum, and the fats and the proteins, for example, and they get broken down and digested in the small bowel. Carbohydrates are sneaky. They, well, for, for our good, of course, they escape digestion and go into the colon. The little bacteria that we were talking about encounter 
the carbohydrates and they produce short chain fatty acids that are awesome, and we'll talk about how awesome they are in a little bit, but they also produce gases like methane gas, CO2 gas, and hydrogen gas. There are other gases, but these are the main ones, and that is what we have flatulence as, and so sometimes you can have um, a little bit smelly ones, and that just depends on what kind of gas there is. Um, so let's talk about the short-chain fatty acids. I mean, what's the craze of, of, about these short-chain fatty acids? It turns out, these are the colon cells, by the way. It looks like Mrs. Pac-Man, but backwards. But anyway, these are supposed to be colon um, cells. These are the little villi. The short-chain fatty acids are, are actually food for the colon cells. So these people going on low-fiber diets, they're starving their cells, basically. There's such thing as the carnivore diet. Can you guys believe that? Seriously? And there's actually a doctor promoting it. It's really sad. Anyhow, uh, people do anything for attention these days. <laughs> so um, there, it, it's the primary energy source for the colonocytes. And if there's like a cancer pro, uh, in any cells, the short chain fatty acids repair mutations and actually help kill cancer cells. So that's perhaps why high fiber diets are preventive against colon cancer, which is the second biggest cancer killer in the United States in both men and women. When it comes to the liver, it reduces inflammation. Have you guys heard of fatty liver disease? Did you know that fatty liver disease is now the number one cause of chronic liver disease in the United States? Because of metabolic syndrome and obesity? It, there used to be a time when Back when I was a fellow, well, actually by then, fatty liver disease was the uh, biggest cause, but before I was in training, people, the liver doctors had to worry about hepatitis C because of the baby boomers um, and injectable drug use and hepatitis B. But now, viral hepatitis is not the common cause of chronic liver disease, it is fatty liver disease from obesity and a high fat diet, diet not in whole food fats uh, like avocado and nuts and seeds, we're talking about saturated fat that comes um, from meat and dairy. So what about adipose tissue? It actually decreases adipose tissue mass. Yeah, more fiber for me for sure. And um, by the way, ad adipose tissue is fatty tissue. And it increases leptin production, which reduces your appetite. Um, muscular, uh, in, uh, skeletal muscle, it increases oxidative type 1 fiber percentage. It's no wonder all these Olympians are now starting to eat a plant-based diet. All these basketball players, football players, cyclists are eating a plant-based diet because they're feeling better. They're seeing the advantage. There's a movie called The Game Changers. Have you all seen it? It's an awesome movie. And it shows the power of plants and these athletes getting so much advantage by eating a plant-based diet. So in order to compare the plant-based diet to the omnivore diet, I'll have to show you well, what's basically in the two groups. The whole food plant-based diet is rich in fiber. Average fiber intake is between 60 to 100 grams per day. How, ma how many grams of fiber do you eat, Dahlia? I would say near 80 and 100 plus. Awesome, 80 to 100. The average American um, in this country doesn't even get 15 grams of fiber per day. Imagine that. So fruits, vegetables, legumes, grains, nuts, and seeds. It's low in fat, no cholesterol, because where does cholesterol come from? Animal products. Small amounts of saturated fat. Let's look at the omnivore diet. Low, moderate fiber, average fiber intake is 10 to 50 grams. There's fruits, vegetables, grains, nuts, seeds, not as much though, but it's heavy on meat, eggs, and dairy. And there's moderate to high levels of saturated fat and cholesterol. So remember, a lot of saturated fat, a little bit of saturated fat. That's important when I talk about the gut mucosal integrity and health. All right. So there's all these Instagram models coming out and they're like, you know, 
I eat a high fiber diet and I get bloated and sick, so I'm going to stop being a vegan. It's like, look, if you're trying to get attention, don't blame the vegan diet. What's not evidence based is that, oh, and, and by the way, they go to their practitioners who don't understand nutrition. That happens all the time. We were just talking about this. Most doctors don't understand nutrition because we're not taught in school. And if we know nutrition, it's because we did our due diligence and studied it because we care. And most dietitians don't know nutrition. Would you guys agree? Thank you. That it's, if our dietitians don't understand dietitian diet, we're in trouble, just say, you know? And so there are very few people that I've met in this world in, in regards to, as far as doctors and dietitians who understand diet, diet, and these two are amazing. If you guys have any questions afterwards, we're here to, to answer any questions. So anyway, you would go to the doctor and you're like, I'm gassy. They'll be like, oh, you're on a vegan diet. That makes you gassy, go eat fish and eggs. Really? There's no evidence on that, by the way, if you ever heard it. Because that happens a lot. Um, so they say, oh, if you eat less gassy foods, your IBS and SIBO goes away. Let's get this straight. Foods aren't gassy. People are gassy. <laughs> All right. The paleo diet. Hmm, the paleo diet. Since when has that been healthy? I mean, people are eating it for health. And I'm like, have you guys read the literature? Because... It doesn't make sense to me. The autoimmune diet, turns out, it's not so autoimmune after all. Seriously, it's autoimmune causing. Food combining, where did that come from? There's like people coming out, Instagram models. I don't food combine, and that's why I look like the way I look. It's like, come on, don't make stuff up, and people believe it. And uh, the carnivore diet, the keto diet, which is super popular. I was on the Atkins diet. Like, people think they're so cool, I'm on the keto diet. Well, I was on that like 25 years ago. It was called the Atkins, and Dr. Atkins died of heart failure. So not so cool. Yeah, exactly. And now it's called the keto, they, like they revamped it, called it keto, and people are like, oh, new diet fad, okay, let's do it. Terrible. But what is evidence-based in regards to recommendations for controlling IBS and SIBO is the low FODMAP diet. So you will hear about that, the low FODMAP diet and low carb diet, but I'll tell you, this diet only, only controlled symptoms and it didn't heal the gut. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So 10 years ago, everyone's like, so okay, b before the, t the last decade, everyone was like, wow, let's like look at, now that we know about the microbiome, let's look at carnivore animals and see what their uh, microbiome looks like, compare that to the omnivore animals and see what their gut microbiome looks like and look at the plant-based animals and see what their gut microbiome looks like. So that was really interesting because the carnivores and the omnivores and the plant-based, uh, plant, plant-based, yeah, um, animals had completely different microbiome, right? So they, somebody thought, huh, maybe humans are the same, right? So if you're eating a carnivore diet, omnivore diet, would your stool look different than a plant-based diet? So about 10 years ago, they, this study took, went to Burkina Faso um, in Africa and took, and they took, uh, they compared 14 healthy Burkina Faso children to 15 European children. Um, the Burkina Faso ch children ate the traditional rural African diet, low in fat and animal protein, rich in starch, fiber, plant polysaturides, kind of like what I eat, mainly cereals, millet grains, uh, sorghum, legumes, and vegetables. Yum. <laughs> the European children eat a typical Western diet, high in what kind of fat? And what other fat? Cholesterol, exactly, saturated fat and cholesterol. Low in what fiber? I mean, never mind. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, anyway, so the fiber, oh, sorry, go back. The fiber content of the European, European children is, was about 5.6 grams compared to 8.4 grams. Um, uh, yeah, and the average amount of fiber in Burkina Faso diet was 10 and 14. Okay, so just look at this um, right here. 
oops, eight grams versus 14 grams in the Burkina Faso children. And um, this is children younger than two, 5.6 grams versus 10 grams. So what happened? They looked at the short chain fatty acid production and look at the Burkina Faso children and look at the fecal amounts of short chain fatty acids in the European children. And these are basically also short chain fatty acids, but this is the total short chain fatty acids. These are the subcategories. They also noticed a lot of inflammatory bacteria in the European children compared to the Burkina Faso children. This is pretty amazing. Let me see if I have that pretty diagram. Okay. There's, there was another study. After that one, people got more motivated, but they said, okay, but what if that was geographical? That was a geographic relation, meaning if any, anybody who lives in Burkina Faso is going to have um, more short-chain fatty acids and it has nothing to do with diet, maybe it's geographical. So this group did this study where they took 326 individuals aged 17 to, uh, up to 17 years. They took 83 Malawians, 65 Amerindians, and 178 residents of the U.S. from St. Louis. Um, so Africa and the Amazon... Venezuela, and the St. Louis people. Um, and basically, they also took 202 adults, and again, Mer Malawians, Amerindians, and U.S. people. And this is what they saw. They saw that the U.S. had a whole different type of gut microbiome than the Malawian and the Amerindians. So, Basically, these, Africa and Venezuela are very far away, but they had this one thing in common is their diet is plant-based. All right, so there was a huge difference. And they noticed that the gut microbiome diversity, of, oh, by the way, the gut microbiome diversity is very healthy, okay? If you want to have a good gut microbiome diversity, you have to eat at least 30 different plant species per week. The gut microbiome diversity is a good sign of health. And the Americans had the lowest diversity, and the Amerindians and the Malawians had the highest diversity. So this study was like, okay, well, let's figure out what happens if you eat fat. Okay, so what's wrong with fat? So they went and gave these, um, basically these mice, um, a standard chow, which had 28 grams of, um, which 28% was protein, 60% carbs, and 12% fat. Does that remind you of the whole food plant based diet or what, right? It's kind of like the same type of distribution. And this group got the high fat diet, like what some people would eat on a keto diet 20% protein, 35% carbs, and 45% fat. And the fat was saturated fat and lard. And basically, they noticed that. Um, the large, the, the, there was large alterations upon switching mice to a high-fat diet. They had increased firmicutes and proteobacteria, which are the inflammatory types of bacteria, and they had decreased bacterioides, which are the health-promoting bacteria. Okay, So based on that, we realized that there is a huge correlation between a high-fat diet and increased in firmicutes and proteobacteria, and decreased in the good guys, the bacterioides. Um, and they also did these uh, genetic manipulations to make sure that the mice were knockout mice, so they didn't get fat from the high-fat diet, and still had the changes. So that meant that a high-fat diet is inflammatory. All right. So then this study came, which is one of my favorite studies in the world, because 20 years ago, I was in a, 15 to 20 years ago, I was in a nutrition class, and my professor actually said, you know, carbs are completely unnecessary. You don't even need to eat carbs to live. Totally unnecessary. And that's, by the way, back when I jumped on the bandwagon of the Atkins diet, and I thought, oh, okay, if I can lose weight. I was overweight six years ago, by the way. I planned to change my diet to a plant-based diet. I was, I don't know if you guys were here the last time I talked, but I had debilitating postular eczema all over my body. I was itching every day of my life. I was living on medications to be able to survive. I couldn't sleep at night. I was depressed. Uh, yeah, I was, I was a mess, yeah. 
and I was overweight. Um, um, what else could happen? I mean, I'm just, oh, I had high cholesterol. Things were not going very well for me. And six years ago, I switched to a whole food plant-based diet, and I, my waistline kept shrinking, and I looked shredded, and I was like working out and looking really good. And I always worked out, but I was like just, I switched to a plant-based diet, and I would be at the gym, and people would walk up to me and ask me for um, fitness advice. And I was like, oh, it's kind of cool. You know, because I was like, I always like looked at myself as this fluffy kind of overweight person. And here people are coming up to me and asking me for fitness advice. I was like, yes, you know, this is so cool. I got so brave after a while that I went and did a fitness competition literally nine months after my plant-based nutrition uh, switch six years ago. And I stepped on a bodybuilding stage. Um, and I was one of those big muscular bodybuilders. I was the bikini category, which means just fit and tone. Um, and I actually um, won. So that was really good. <laughs> Thank you. But it was so miraculous because, um, I mean, the looks of it was great, fantastic, but I actually, guys actually started noticing me. It was like, yay. But um, the, what was awesome, okay, was that my eczema went away. I literally spent every night of my life, I would take Benadryl to fall asleep and put corticosteroids all over my skin, and my eczema went away. It turned out that I was allergic to the casein protein in milk. So when I'm in dairy-free, my sinuses got better. My, and no dermatologist ever told me stop eating dairy. I don't know why they didn't, but oh well. I'm glad I switched. And I only, did, like, by the way, I've been plant based because of the animals. I was like, I can't eat animals. I, I love animals. And it, it was just all because. And, and then I found, I washed forks over knives. And I was like, whoa, this is cool because I can actually be healthier and I can help my patients. So anyway, it was, it was just really cool for me. So uh, my professor said, you know what, you don't, you don't even need to eat carbohydrates. So I went, that's why I went on that uh, Atkins journey, and I was really sick, and I stopped eventually. But anyway, this study for the first time showed that actually, guess what, fiber is an essential macronutrient for the gut, okay? So what they did is, um, so first of all, there is a gut mucus layer, which people are not aware of. This is really important. So your cells are sitting next to each other. That's the gray part. There is macrovilli, those little needly things. And then there is a mucus layer. And then there's the microbiome living on top of the mucus layer. All right, did you guys know that? Most people don't, yeah. So this is the first line of defense against in invading pathogens. It's produced by goblet cells, blah, blah, blah. Who cares? These are cells living here, and they spit out mucus, mucin, right? It's kind of cool. Um, they're, um, it's tightly adherent to the, adherent to the uh, epithelium here. Um, it's poorly colonized, which is a good thing. You don't see much bacteria in there, do you? Because it's a protective layer. Um, it's basically composed of mucin and stuff, whatever, polysaturate content. And um, it is, however, a dietary source for even the good bacteria if you're starving your body and not eating enough fiber, okay? So it becomes food for the good guys who are trying to protect you, but when you're starving them, they're like, I have nothing to eat, I'm going to eat the mucus layer, okay? So... Um, I don't know why that slide keeps popping up. I must have done something wrong with me. I'm not very technolo technologically advanced. Anyhow, so this study showed that when you eat a high-fat diet, meaning saturated, I'm not talking about avocados and nuts and seed, seeds, but when you eat a high-fat diet, what it does is it literally breaks down these tight junctions that are in between the cells to keep the cells together, okay? And it causes leakiness. Furthermore, it showed that the endotoxins that are byproducts of bacteria. So let me tell you what that is. You know when you cook your meat, you're going to kill the bacteria, the salmonella, the E. coli. But the toxins get released and they're, they're not going to get killed with heat. So those are called... LPS or lipopolysaturides, and they're called basically byproducts and endotoxins. Guess what happens to them? They escape into your blood and circulate from head to toe in your body, causing inflammation. OK? 
okay? The other thing this study showed is that saturated fat decreases the expression of the tight junctions between the cells, to, to, which gets the uh, gut leaky, and it prevents it from basically regenerating. So, um, this study showed that a high-fat diet causes... So let me tell you what happens when you eat a high-fat diet quickly. Um, there's a hormone called CCK, cholecystokinin, and this guy gets produced when you eat a high-fat diet. And it comes out, and the CCK squeezes the gallbladder, and the gallbladder produces a whole bunch of bile into your intestines. These are primary bile salts, but when there's excess production, what happens is these primary bile salts get converted to secondary bile salts in the colon by the bacteria, and that is toxic to your cells. So secondary bile salts are bad. Why do they come about when you have a high-fat diet? Okay? So this study showed a high-fat diet causes increased production of secondary bile acids, which are toxic to the gut. All right. I'm going to show you a boring slide, and then I'm going to make it interesting. Is that a good deal? But I'm going to pick on you guys. I'm going to need some volunteers here in a minute. So get ready. All right. This is a normal... Oh, my gosh. This is so busy. I apologize. Okay. Just bear with me here. Cell, cell, cell. Goblet cell. Remember the mucus producing ones I was talking about? Okay, they spit out mucus over here to, pr pr to provide that protective mucus layer I was talking about. Cell, cell, cell. Between these cells right here, there's tight junctions. This is a blown up picture of a tight junction. Don't worry about it. So, cell, cell, okay, tight junction. So, this cell is attached to this cell and there is no, nothing going to go in between them because of these tight junctions, okay? There is some white, there's some lymphocytes and basically cells, sorry, this is not working, come on. All right, there's some cells, those blue round guys are just white cells sitting there going, I'm here and ready to attack if I need to. They're just sitting there doing nothing. This is what happens when you eat a high-fat diet, saturated fat. Boom. Did you see the difference? What happened to the cells? They became leaky because the bonds are now broken. The tight junctions are broken down. Furthermore, these cells become angry because they're encountering secondary bile cells, fatty oxidized fatty acids, and they're like, what the heck is going on here? Well, I'm going to produce some cytokines, interleukins, and TNF-alphas, and pro-inflammatory stuff to flag down other cells to come and help us with this war that's happening. So that's where other white cells get recruited because the interleukins and TNF-alphas and the cytokines are like, help, help. And all these other cells come and attack. Have you guys heard of inflammatory bowel disease? Boom. Have you heard of rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, autoimmune diseases? So there is now thought that if you fix the leakiness of the gut and you repair these tight junctions, the inflammation goes up. So that's why a lot of people with lupus, they say, I've been on a whole food plant-based diet, and my lupus went away. It's easy, because the science is there, you guys. It's, it's all there. And auto, autoimmune diseases get better on a whole food plant-based diet because of that reason. All right, I want to show you guys. I, needed a, I need 10 of you up here. Please come on. Thank you. Dahlia and James, I need to help get your help in helping me just set it up. <laughs> They've seen this demonstration before. Should we do it here? Yes. All right, guys, come on. Come on. We won't make fun of you. Come on here. Yeah. I want 10. We'll do it like this. Yeah, we'll do it. Hi, thank you. You make a good looking colon cell. <laughs> here, hold hands. All right. You're another colon cell right now, OK? Um, can I borrow you here? <laughs> so you're going to be a colon cell right now, okay? Thank you. Okay, perfect. Do we have enough? All right. 
Dahlia here, she's really pretty, okay? But she is cheese right now. We're gonna, she's gonna be playing the role of saturated fat, all right? So we're gonna pretend, if you can imagine, she's gonna be the bad guy. Come back here, you're gonna be fiber, you're gonna be the good guy, okay? She's the bad guy, he's the good guy. Okay, so saturated fat, so let's just say you're like, I'm gonna have a cheese pizza, okay? Full of saturated fat. Saturated fat is the mean guy. This is what she's gonna do, Dahlia. Show them what happens. Boom, boom, karate chopping all those tight junctions. Oh boy, that's really mean. Anyway, the dairy industry says cheese is good for you, so why wouldn't you eat it, right? Anyway, oh, um, I'm gonna use, uh, can, may I borrow you for a second here? Would you come on over here, please? Yeah, now this, she, you're, you're so cute, but you're gonna be endotoxemia. You're gonna cause endotoxemia because you're actually gonna be one of those toxic things from meat. Is that okay? okay. I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> so come on over here. Okay, come on over here. She's a toxin that came from meat and just go right into the circulation right there and stand right there. Okay, this toxin just got through in between the tight junctions and now she can go and circulate in the rest of the body. So this is what happens when the gut gets leaky. The tight junctions are gone because of dietary choices, and the gut is leaky, so toxins get right in, and you are gonna flag the white cells. So this row is gonna be our white cells. Okay, you guys are gonna attack the colon, all right? We won't ask you to come up here, but just <laughs> use your imagination. Okay, but you know what? But we have a good guy here, right here. Where's your cape? <laughs> he is fiber, and he's going to produce short-chain fatty acids. Short-chain fatty acids, yeah. You're going to stay out. Yeah. He is interacting with the gut microbiome because he's fiber, and he is going to produce short-chain fatty acids, which are going to repair the bonds. All right? So if you have leaky gut, it's not too late. The toxins now, now pretend like you were on this side of the gate, okay? Try to get into the blood. All the gates are closed. You can, can you? All right, I'm gonna escort you back to your chair. Thank you so much. You were awesome. Thanks everybody for your help. All right. I love this study because it showed that actually within one day you can fluctuate uh, the type of gut microbiome um, there is in the body. So if you take somebody on a plant-based diet and you give them a bunch of meat and dairy, within one day they will have what we call bilophilic or bile-loving gut microbiome increase in their body. It's within one day. Um, all right. The other thing that's really awful is besides saturated fat. So I'm hoping that I demonize saturated fat enough, right? Right? Okay. So let's pick on animal protein. So what's wrong with animal protein? It turns out that when you eat animal protein, it contains a lot of carnitine and choline. Choline comes from seafood and cheese, and um, carnitine comes from, mostly from um, red meat. And they go down your colon and the colonic bacteria convert them to a molecule called TMA, which goes into your circulation, into your liver, and it becomes TMAO. And TMAO is extremely dangerous for your health and causes heart disease, kidney disease, metabolic syndrome, and diabetes. Interestingly, for every 10 micromolar increase in TMAO, there's a 7.6 percent increase in all-cause mortality, as shown in a large study with 25,000 participants. So it's no joke. No wonder we have so much heart disease. I mean, almost everyone in the hospital I see has heart disease. And, oh, I was telling someone this. This is kind of cool, you guys. When I go to the hospital to uh, work over there, I, I have an outpatient practice in Newport Beach, but I go to the hospital just because I want to keep up my inpatient skills. Um, and I would go like see 30 patients, 29 out of 30 had basically preventable causes and they're there because they made bad choices in regards to nutrition. Can you believe it? 
Maybe one person came in because they have some kind of a genetic disease of some sort, but it's really, really sad. All right. <laughs> I love this God. What about probiotics? What if I just want to like eat my cheese pizza and eat my steak, but why don't I just take a probiotic and get the good gut microbiome and call it a day? Can we do that? Well, the studies are not supporting that. Probiotics don't do much for you. Sorry to say, there's no magic pill. In a study um, over here, they actually looked at all right, so this is what they did. Um, you guys know what fecal microbial transplants are? Okay, so they did an autologous fecal microbial transplant. So they take, took people's stool and they kept it. And so they give people antibiotics, they eradicated the bacteria in the gut based on the antibiotics. Then what they did is they gave one group autologous uh, fecal microbial transplant. Then they gave one group probiotics and they gave one group nothing and they saw, well, let's see if probiotics help. Does it, do they help at all? Or doing nothing maybe helps or maybe autologous transplant helps. It turned out that <laughs> surprisingly, the people who got probiotics, it took them longer to come back to homeostasis. So the probiotics somehow perhaps maybe competed with the local residents and they in disinhibited the homeostasis of the gut microbiome back to normal. And the autologous transplant people did really well. Okay, their microbiome came right back. But somehow the group that got probiotics did really badly and they did um, worse than the group that didn't get any probiotics. So ever since this data, people come to me and they say, oh, my doctor put me on, on an antibiotic for a kidney infection, should I stop? I say, no, you could die of a kidney infection. Should I take probiotics? I say, no, <laughs> that would not be a good idea. Okay, so, Remember the four fundamentals. This is really easy, right? High fiber diet is good for you. And I'm not talking about supplement fiber. I'm talking about actually eating fruits and vegetables because people ask me that. By high fiber, you mean metamucil, right? No, I mean eat your fruits and vegetables. <laughs> I mean, there's always like, this culture of, can I get it in a package and like make it easier? Oh my goodness. Um, low, low fiber diet is bad for you. A high fat diet is bad for you. Animal protein is bad for you, right? Simple. But for some reason, but for some reason, when you go to these practitioners, I just showed you the data, okay? It's so easy. The data is clear. But for some reason, every time somebody goes and tells their practitioner, I'm bloated, they're like, oh, stop the veggies. Oh man, really? Before they say stop the saturated fat, before they say stop the meat, they're like, stop the vegetables. Beans make you gassy? Then stop eating beans. How about broccoli? Does that make you gassy? Definitely stop the broccoli. It's terrible. Why is that bad? Because those fiber-rich foods are good for you, so you don't want to just eliminate them out of your diet because you get a little bloated. Why don't we address the underlying cause? Okay, we have now, it's gotten so bad that like the entire physician and I mean, not, a, not the entire community, but the majority of doctors recommend a low fiber diet, that low FODMAP diet that I told you about, because there was some evidence that it helps a little bit. It's gotten so bad that Dahlia, James and I got so mad because <laughs> every time a, a patient goes to the doctor, they're like, get off that fiber, get off this vegetables, get off the beans, it's great. So we got so mad, we're like, one day we're like, I'm like, guys, we need to do something about this. Stop complaining about it. We just need to do something. So we got together, we came up with a SIBO protocol for people who have SIBO and IBS. So they don't, they're not told mistakenly to stop eating their fruits and vegetables. You know, it's not the fact, so the response that you have to these vegetables is important, okay? So 
I can eat beans and not get gassy. Why is that? Because I can break it down and I have a robust gut microbiome to be able to break it down. Now, if you gave me broccoli, like when I was on the Atkins diet, I remember I was studying for the MCAT, which is the, this difficult entrance uh, exam to medical school. I was on that Atkins diet I was telling you about, and I, one day I was like, I'm gonna eat three pieces of broccoli, literally three pieces, like tiny little broccoli pieces. I went to the library to study and my belly felt like that, and I looked like I was pregnant, and my bowel sounds were like <laughs> Literally, I had to leave the quiet room because people were giving me looks. I couldn't even digest three pieces of broccoli. Should I stop eating broccoli? No. So now I can eat this much broccoli, plus this much beans, plus this much whatever else you want to give me, and I'm still not going to have bloating. I will have a little bit of distension because you put that much food in your body, you're going to have a little bit of distension, but I'm not going to have bloating. So it's the response that you have to these foods that's important. Okay, so don't demonize the foods. Try to improve your gut microbiome diversity so you can handle the breaking down of these foods that are healthy. Now, of course, if you get bloated and gassy and diarrhea from dairy, please do stop. <laughs> I'm talking about good foods here. Bad foods, by all means, stop. But if it's a good food, don't be so quick to stop eating it because you get a little bloated. You have to build up the gut microbiome diversity. So we have actually a group we, we've dedicated our lives to this morning and night. We worked on it, and we have this thing for SIBO and IBS patients. It's an online protocol to be able to help, help get the word out. But SIBO, um, it's a very, very awful problem. People feel like, they, literally, that's what people feel like. That's not what people look like, but there's so much inflammation in their body, they feel like nine months pregnant and super bloated. And when you look at their bellies, like they come to me and they're, they tell me, look, listen, I'm so uncomfortable. And I look at their belly, it's like, yeah, a little distended, but it's not like, but they feel like this. They look different, but they really do feel like that. They feel miserable. Um, so we we're going to talk about symptoms of SIBO, clinical manifestations, blah, blah, blah. And then we're talking about the reverse diet, elimination diet. All right. So I remember I told you guys... Um, Okay, so let me tell you this. In 2018, they did a meta-analysis and found that actually 38% of IBS causes were people with IBS had SIBO. This is really important because because of this study, we found out that people don't, are not doomed to have IBS for the rest of their lives. If you fix the gut microbiome imbalance and dysbiosis, which is SIBO, you could actually get rid of their IBS. In the old days, if you were diagnosed with IBS, you had it for the rest of your life. But now we know if you fix the dysbiosis, the IBS goes away. Um, okay, so in this study, they gave people with IBS a antibiotic called rifaximine, and their IBS went away. Um, but when you, a lot of people come to you and they say, I have bloating. So you have to figure out, okay, what does that mean? Bloating is a very commonly used term. But some people will come and tell you that they have bloating, and then you look at them, and they pinch a little bit of fat here, and they say, I'm bloated, see? Uh, no, <laughs> that's a tiny little fat, okay, you're allowed. <laughs> and, you know, and they say, I've been blo I'm bloated morning till night, I wake up with bloating, go to bed with bloating. That's not gas, because that kind of bloating that you get after you have kids, all right, that's just subcutaneous, pinchable fat in your belly. That's not bloating, that's subcutaneous fat. Then there's people who come to you and they're like, yeah, I'm so bloated all day and all night, like every day. And, and you look at their diet, they're eating like burgers and cheeseburgers and fries and drink beer every night. And then usually men, and they come to you and they have a little bit of bloating. And that's, that's not pinchable fat. It's hard, it look, they look pregnant, it's not pinchable. That's mesenteric fat. That's fat that's inside the belly, inside the liver, around the bowels. That's not under the skin. You can't even pinch it. And then you really have real bloating. And that's the lady on top. She wakes up in the morning with a flat stomach. And then when she eats, she feels inflamed and her belly just goes. Phew. That's real bloating and gas. It's theorized that this bloating is just simply because of gas. I doubt it. 
I know that in the next 10, 20 decades, which actually I'm going to hopefully study this, that this is not just actual distension from a little bit of gas. I think it's that inflammation that you saw in the lamina propria of the gut. Remember the white cells attacking? I think it's mostly inflammation. That, because when you look at these people, they have a little bit of bloating, but they feel like, right? So that inflammation gives them that exaggerated feeling, like they're nine months pregnant, but they're a little bit bloated. Doesn't that happen a lot where people come in and they're actually thin and they have a little bit of belly popping and they're like, oh, I feel so miserable. It couldn't be because their belly is a little distended. There's inflammation in there. All right, let's see. Okay, with people with SIBO can have vitamin deficiencies because they have fat malabsorption. The fat, they get the, the fat goes into the stool. They actually sometimes have fatty uh, like oil droplets in the toilet bowl. And so they don't absorb vitamin A, D, K, and E very well. They um, have excess of folate uh, because those bacteria actually make folate. Because did you know the bacteria, gut microbiome actually is able to produce vitamins? Did you know that? Yeah, so a lot of people get so obsessed about their vitamin intake and nutrient intake. The microbiome takes care of a lot of that. You don't have to think so hard. Okay, so what causes SIBO? So many things, so many things. Um, basically, if you have diverticulosis, have you guys heard of diverticula? There's these pockets in the colon, there you go. Very common. Every time I do a colonoscopy, every day when I do a colonoscopy, I have at least three or four patients who have diverticulosis. It's very common. Interestingly, if you study the African population who are on a whole food plant-based diet, diverticulosis is like unheard of. Isn't that funny? In America, everyone has it. Um, if you get radiation uh, to the bowel or you have Crohn's disease, have, you guys have heard of Crohn's disease where there's like fistula, like a tunnel that co connects the colon to the small bowel so the colon microbiome can just free flow into the small intestine, um, gastric resection, um, surgeries, surgeries. That's why it's always important not to have surgery if you don't have to. It's really bad to have bowel surgery. If it's a matter of life and death, of course, by all means. But it's really important not to just unnecessarily go get a gastric bypass surgery when you could just lose weight, perhaps, on your own. This is why a lot of uh, bariatric surgeons put people under intense uh, diet and exercise plans to help them lose weight. And if they really can't, then they will do the surgery. But anyway, it's, it's, so it's really any surgery to the bowel can cause this. Motility disorders like gastroparesis, people with diabetes, their bowels are slow. Imagine a spring, like uh, water's flowing through the spring and fast and clear water, pretty, and you can drink it in the mountains. I like camping, so I always like think of streams. And then imagine a canal on the side of the road in France or Iran, where I'm from. Stale water, green, yucky, it's accumulating algae and bacteria. That is a bowel that has dysmotility and it's not moving very well. So the spring water versus the canal water. If the water is not flowing, it's gonna accumulate bacteria growth, right? So you want your bowels to be like the stream, naturally, not by taking laxatives and colon cleanses and colonics and all that stuff, right? Anyway, so if, if it's stale, it's gonna accumulate bacteria. Celiac disease, chronic constipation, and by the way, what's the number one cause of constipation in this country? That's right. Um, metabolic disorders like um, obesity and diabetes. Um, the elderly are at, um, at, uh, you know, at a risk. Maybe that's because most of our elderly patients in this country are on a hundred different medicines. That could be, you know. Um, I had a patient today, plant-based. She came to come to all my conferences. <laughs> she's so cute. And she's a cyclist. She's like 70-some years old, and she's so energetic. She has purple hair. Like, I love her. She's so sweet. She definitely doesn't have SIBO. 
Um, and she, which her complaints are so funny. I'm like looking at her like, really? Like you're worried about this? I mean, like, she has the minor complaints, you know, and she's like, most people her age are like, can't even walk or like take themselves to the doctor. And this lady's like flying around, meeting me at San Francisco for a conference over here for a conference. She's amazing. Anyhow, um, organ dysfunctions. Um, oh, yeah, medications is another cause. So like a lot of people on these Nexium pills, omeprazole, Prilosec, SFX, Renitidine, may I go? I mean, I could go on. So they're all bad for you unless you really, really have to take them. You shouldn't. Um, I understand that some people need to take, I give those medicines myself sometimes, but risk benefit ratio has to always be looked at. And as soon as you can get off of it, once you fix your diet, you should get off of it. Um, let's see. Um, okay. Oh, and malnutrition and narcotic drug use are also big causes. Alcoholism. Um, yeah. Um, let's see. Alcoholism. You know, I just, you know, there's a lot of hydrogen, the sulfite products in alcohol that somehow alcohol is very toxic to the gut and it can cause dysbiosis. And there's some byproducts that are produced that damage the cells. Let's see, endocrine disorders, hypothyroidism is an extremely common cause. Why, why is that? Because when you have hypothyroidism, your bowels don't move very well. So remember, the water is not flowing. All right, so, um, so what are not what's not a cause of SIBO? Boom, a vegan diet is not, does not cause SIBO. A high fiber diet does not cause SIBO. A whole food plant-based diet does not cause SIBO. This is important because a lot of people who get bloated and they have SIBO, they blame the vegan diet because they're eating a lot of fiber. No, it's because your bowels are not doing well. They can't handle the fiber. Don't blame it on the high fiber diet. <laughs> All right, so how do you diagnose SIBO? You could go down into the small intestine. I scope people sometimes, but I don't like to scope them for this reason, to get an aspirate from the jejunum, send it to the lab to see, it's so, so hard, you have to put people under anesthesia, stick a big long scope into their mouth, that's not a good way. So now there's a breath test for it, which makes it really easy. It turns out that methane and hydrogen gas that you get uh, ferment, uh, pr produced through fermentation in the colon, our own cells don't produce fr uh, methane and hydrogen, right? Our own eukaryotic cells don't, only the bacteria. So that gas diffuses into the blood and you exhale it. <sighs> when you exhale that gas, this machine can capture the gases and people that go, <sighs> close it and send it to the lab, and there's a machine that can calculate how much gas is in there, and if it's more than a certain amount, that's called SIBO. Okay, this is helpful for patients with IBS and extensive bloating, because it can be cured overnight, if you find out. Uh, so there's different types of gases. Um, okay, so what's important with SIBO and IBS is you have to take care of the underlying cause. Otherwise, if you just keep throwing medications added, you're band-aid treating it, okay? So um, it's, they, they, they've shown that 44% of successfully treated uh, people with antibiotics relapse within nine months. Okay, so these are doctors who are saying, oh, you have SIBO, here's an antibiotic but they never address the hypothyroidism or perhaps the fact that they're on PPI medicines or perhaps the fact that they have gastroparesis from diabetes and they're still eating saturated fat and making their diabetes worse, okay? And I blame doctors a lot, but I have to be honest with you, 50% of the problem is the patients who don't wanna be compliant and you can only do so much. Doctors are uneducated about nutrition, but some people, they just don't care, and you can only do so much. If you like your saturated fat, cheese, more than you like your health, I don't know what to tell you. Eat only a little bit, please. Um, all right, uh, so you have to treat the underlying cause, and nutritional support is everything. That's why I have two talented registered dietitians in my clinic. It's a multidisciplinary approach, okay? Private practice these days is very hard to survive. Insurances have cut, and reimbursement uh, is 
terrible. And the minute you start talking to your patients, you lose money. So you're like, you have 10 minutes to go blah, 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 got it. Much less talk about nutrition. So I have two talented RDs who are in my clinic. So I'm like, now you need nutrition therapy, but you can't talk to me. You have to talk to Dolly or James, which is good because they know more about nutrition than I. It's all good, but it's, it's got to be a multidisciplinary approach. Surprisingly, when I tell people you need to see a dietitian, they're like, is that going to cost me anything? I'm like, really? You're on 50 medicines. And the copays collectively will cost you more in one year than your dietitian visit. Please, don't put a price on your health. Why is it that we, we don't care about learning about nutrition? Everyone wants a pill. And in this case, you can't throw a pill at it, really. You have to fix the tight junctions, right? How can I fix the tight junctions with vitamins? I can't. There's nothing out there. It's diet. Okay. All right. Uh, so you could um, then, so there's that FODMAP diet that I told you about. It showed that it reduced symptoms of SIBO, by all, but by all means, it did not take away the underlying cause. So if you ever have someone tell you, well, I had IBS and I'm on a FODMAP diet, low FODMAP diet, please educate them. Low FODMAPs means basically it's low fermentable fibers, which are um, oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. So these are prebiotics for the gut microbiome. Okay, so what happens when you take away the FODMAPs and you go on a low FODMAP diet? You're taking away food from the gut microbiome. So you have less fermentation and temporarily you feel better, but it's not curing you and it causes problems because it decreases the diversity of the gut microbiome and it decreases those awesome short-chain fatty acids in the gut. So the low FODMAP diet is not an answer. It is merely a band-aid therapy, which we're very good at in America. <laughs> so we are now getting ready to launch a uh, prospective randomized control trial with um, some universities and some groups I won't mention right now, but we are trying to do a randomized control trial to put one arm, which is the standard of care, unfortunately, in, this, in, in America, the FODMAP diet, and compare it to our diet, which we have developed. It's called the reverse elimination diet, where we take people who've been avoiding beans and grains and fruits and vegetables, blah, 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 and we actually do a reverse elimination and we slowly bring back these prebiotic fiber rich foods back into their diet. So what we're doing is we're comparing the two and we're proving, hopefully I'm right, <laughs> that it's going to outperform the FODMAP diet and at the end we know that the short chain fatty acid production will be higher, we'll know people will have a, um, their comorbidities like diabetes and cholesterol will go away perhaps, we're going to have um, the breath test to see if the breath test, I mean, we're just going to test all the parameters but um, so we're recruiting people for the study, if you know anybody with SIBO IBS please send them to us, we are recruiting right now, we're going to make that FODMAP diet obsolete for good. All right, this is just showing how FODMAP diet is bad because it decreases the gut microbiome diversity and the good gut microbiome, like bifidobacteria. Um, so basically, um, if you know anybody, I'm going to teach you this cool trick, and you're going to be very proud of yourself. All right. If anybody comes to you and they said they're bloated, make sure the bloating is not subcutaneous fat or mesenteric fat. Make sure it's like gas and bloating. And if they have diarrhea, cramping, pain, all these GI symptoms, they say, tell them, give me one month of your life. And they say, well, what do I, what do I need to do? Say, stop eating anything dairy. And they say, what, are eggs dairy? You say, no, eggs come from chickens. <laughs> yeah, people will ask you that every time. You say, give, don't eat anything that comes from a cow, and then you have to go over it. No butter. No cheese, no, what else, um, milk, yes, milk, of course, what else, yogurt, exactly, oh, and they'll tell you, but yogurt is good for me because it has probiotics, it's like drinking Coke for potassium, <laughs> <laughs>
And you make sure they read labels because everything has dairy. It's a cheap filler subsidized by the government. So if you want to sell in bulk, like fluff things up and make it more volume, voluminous and sell it for more higher weight and more expensive, what do you do? You add the cheap filler dairy to it, right? So tell them, give, give me one month of your life and I don't want you to eat anything dairy. And if they do that, over 50% of them will be cured. They don't need my help. I've literally had hundreds of patients who would come to me and they're like, we looked you up on the internet, we know you're so smart. <laughs> I'm not, I just know a little bit about nutrition. Uh, and they're like, we know you're gonna, you're, you're the last hope we have. We've seen like all these other doctors. If, I was the 13th consultant for one patient. One three, you guys. This guy had the million dollar workup for his abdominal bloating, gas, and diarrhea, and nobody figured it out. He had an MRI, CT scan, ultrasound, blah, blah. I mean, he went, he had everything, and he brought me this much papers, and I went over blah, blah, blah. really quick, five minutes, he's like, there's no way she read through that. I was like, I have, I just need one month of your life. And, oh, and he had like five colonoscopies or something. I was like, I just need one month of your life. And he's like, oh, come on, it can't be that easy. I was like, you know what? Trust me on this. He's good. One month later, he was fine. Wow. Yeah. So 13 consultants who didn't care to discuss nutrition. Not good. Well, they probably don't know. So if you guys have anybody that you know of who has bloating, let me know if I have to stop. Pastor Jensen? Uh, three minutes. Three minutes. Okay. So anyway, so do that. It works. They'll be like, you are so smart. All right. Um, so... We have this yoga connection platform. If you have anybody who needs help with SIBO, IBS, bloating, please send them www.yogaconnection.com. This is where we're also recruiting patients for the study. What we do is we eliminate all animal products during the study because we want to treat and heal the tight junctions, avoid alcohol, refined sugar, which are bad for you, refined oils and environmental toxins. Phase one, we focus on starchy fruits and vegetables. Phase two, we focus on reintroducing simple carbohydrates. Phase three, we reintroduce soaked, sprouted, and uh, well-cooked legumes. And um, uh, phase four, we reintroduce soaked, sprouted nuts and seeds. Phase five, we reintroduce whole grains. Phase six, we reintroduce fermented foods. And then beyond that, we add all kinds of raw foods, and people do really well. Um, Anyway, I'm going to skip over this because this is really not important. This is my group, my two wonderful dietitians, James and Dahlia, and we're here to help you guys if you need any help. And I wanted to thank you, Pastor Jensen, for the invitation to share my knowledge with everyone.